Welcome to Question Time. Tonight we are in Nottingham. On our panel, Penny Morden, the government's trade minister, previously international development secretary and briefly defence secretary under Theresa May. Labour's shadow sport minister, an MP since 2010 and was chair of the moderate progress group of Labour MPs, Alison McGovern. Robert Winston, a pioneer in the field of human fertility and Labour peer, perhaps best known as the presenter of television programmes such as Child in Our Time and The Human Body. Samuel Kasumu, former number 10 communities advisor to Boris Johnson and co-founder of a headhunting firm specialising in diversity and senior editor at The Economist and broadcaster Anne McElvoy. Good evening, welcome to my panel, welcome of course to our audience here in Nottingham and of course welcome to you at home. Do join in the conversation in the usual way on social media at BBC Question Time and we'll hear what you think about what we've got to say. So our first question tonight is from Lorraine, Lorraine Johnson. Against the backdrop of the report into the government's handling of the coronavirus released this week, why is it so difficult for politicians to say sorry? Robert, as the scientist on the panel, do you want to kick us off? Oh, well, I agree, and they should. There's a lot to say sorry for. And I very much regret the kind of blame that is being put by some of the politicians on the scientists. It's interesting that they do this because uh, sitting in the House of Lords, which I do, if you, really, if you ever want to keep a secret, the thing to do is to give a speech in the House of Lords. <laughs> <laughs> but every day of every week during COVID, we were tackling the health minister and we were not getting answers. And we raised all those issues really and squarely from, from, from masks and everything else. And the prob I think the problem is that um, it, it is just very difficult to admit that so many people have died and they're still dying. And, you know, it, it, it's also a virus that, of course, we as scientists did not know quite how to handle because it's very, very unusual virus. The incubation period is different. So, in fact, you're, you're infectious when you're perfectly well. And it's not for some days later that you get ill. And that's not usual. And also, as we gradually learned during the pandemic, it was completely unlike SARS and MERS, I'm afraid to say, in spite of what, the, how, the, the, what Jeremy Hunt says. That the fact of the matter is that it's a totally different kind of virus which affects every organ in the body, including the brain, the gut, and actually has all sorts of different ways of appearing. So that, when, Jeremy that was Hunt astonishing. Says, when Jeremy Hunt said, Robert, that, uh, that the government could have, and scientists could have looked at what was happening in countries like Taiwan, uh, South Korea, in order to, to inform how we reacted here in this country... Do you think he has a point? Well, no, because I think actually they're a very different population. They have very different. They have very different genetics. They have a different resistance. They have different uh, backgrounds to why the disease was prevalent. You've seen from our pandemic that there are certain people who are particularly likely to get the disease and get it very badly, and that was not the same in many other countries. For example, in Asia, who have exposure to different viruses and the viruses that they had were not coronavirus and before beforehand so we couldn't learn from them and we had to do our own thing and if you look at it to be fair every single country in the world including the asian countries didn't do very well we all made mistakes but we made catastrophic errors right from the very beginning and what i find perhaps most disappointing is to see jeremy hunt who was the health service minister the secretary of state for who left the health service in such a shambolic state that we have no gowns for protection for, pa for patients, for, 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 the, for the staff, and a whole range of massive issues which have come clearly in this report. And actually, he doesn't really show any kind of uh, any remorse about it. And I think that's really rather shocking. He did acknowledge that he... In fairness, he did acknowledge that he was part of the group think in terms of yes. preparing for a flu-like pandemic rather than, than the one we saw. So, uh, Penny, catastrophic errors you're hearing from Robert next to you, a lot to say sorry for. Do you want to say sorry? Well, I, I don't have any issue with saying what I regret about uh, the last few years. Um, this week, I mean... Which in, is what? In previous, what would you like to say sorry in for? In previous roles that I've held um, in defence in my last role where I was looking after the infected blood inquiry, I dealt with a lot of next of kin. And this week, even <clears> when a report is welcomed, it would have been a really difficult week for those people. And I've been thinking a lot about them and what they're probably going through at the, at the moment. I think that having seen the scientists, the civil servants, the politicians, everyone who was involved in this nation's response, 
There's not one person uh, that I can think of that wasn't trying to do their very best in that situation. But Penny, the and question is, why is it so difficult for politicians to say sorry? And so far, you haven't said it either. Well, no, I, let me be clear. I, I'm sorry for people's loss. I'm sorry that we didn't do things or didn't know things uh, in advance of uh, that situation. Are you uh, sorry but... that we didn't lock down earlier, which the report says led to one of the most important public health failures the UK has ever experienced? Are you sorry about that? I, I wish we would have done some things differently. But what I'm saying is I know that people did the very best they could at the time. Why this report is important, even though it's not comprehensive and the inquiry needs to be comprehensive, is it also flags up some really important lessons because we're not through this yet. And also the scientists who've been working on the vaccines were working on other things before COVID hit that are still issues for us. Okay. One of the recommendations is in the report is about investing in UK science. So it's, I welcome it. I have no issue in expressing my regret and sorrow for the tremendous loss we've had as a, as a country. And I do that to individuals that I meet in my constituency. Okay. Let but I think we have to learn the lessons uh, and we have to... We're not through this yet. It feels like we are, but we're not. There's a lot of hands up, so let's hear the, the, the lady in the front here in the glasses. Yes. Hello, thank you, Fiona. Hello, panel. Um, firstly, I think not only to say sorry, and I agree exactly, you know, what my, what my friend up there said, I don't think it's just about being sorry, I think it's being accountable. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is, you just said lessons learned. This is, we had this, we kind of talked about this for the last two years on repeat. And something we actually said last year on Question Time was that the government are like a hesitant driver at a roundabout. You don't know which way you're going. There seems to be no strategy, there seems to be no kind of plan. I feel like right now, and what Professor Winston just said, we're still losing people every day. If we had a plane crash every day, what were happening right now, then why aren't we taking notice? Why aren't we taking the lead from other countries? You know, we don't seem to actually... I don't believe the government have actually got their hands on it, basically. I don't actually believe you're in control at all. I think you're taking us through a winter period and we're about to actually hit the brakes again. OK, let's hear... <laughs> Man the back. Yes. Yes, you, sir. So I absolutely agree with the lady at the front. Um, I think it's important to say sorry and show humility. Um, but the, the issue here is, and what's really important, is what are the lessons being learnt and, and what is going to happen moving forward so we don't so this doesn't happen again? Come on there. Following on from that point, I think if the government were truly sorry, then they would launch a public inquiry and not keep putting it off and kicking the can down the road. <laughs> the man at the back there. Um, I do... <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. I do have some sympathy for you, Penny, to be honest. Um, I think a lot of this report is completely based on hindsight and when the government were in that position, staring down the barrel of that gun, they did their best. And you can't expect anything else. It's great to stand at the scene of a road traffic accident and say to the people that have crashed, you should have braked sooner. Fantastic, great, thanks for that information. But the government stepped up, they did the best they could, and the only thing I think you really need to look at is the fact that people were discharged into care homes without testing. That, in my view, is not a benefit of hindsight. That should have been looked at before. That should have been looked at. Samuel, you were um, communities advisor to Boris Johnson during part of this period. You, you would have been in the room, I, I assume, for some of the conversations about COVID. Some, not, not all, yeah. No, of course. Yep. What's your view in terms of the report? and yeah. politicians' responsibility for it. Yeah, no, firstly, very good question by, by Lorraine. And to be fair, I, th I think you're talking about Steve Barclay, who, who, who perhaps didn't apologise during the media rounds earlier in the week. And I, I know Steve personally, and I, and I also know that he's one of the most compassionate ministers in, in government. And, and I know it's a very un unpopular thing to say, but it, it, it is the truth. And, um, and he's, very, he's, he's new in post, and there are probably a number of reasons why perhaps he was not uh, properly briefed before he went on the... Well, he was, he was asked 11 times, I think yeah. it was, to say sorry. And, and also, a lot of politicians have said, I'm sorry for, for people's loss, yeah. well, which is very different to saying, I'm yeah. sorry for some of the decisions that were taken. Yeah. And I think that's partly... Lorraine, is that fair? Is that where your question's coming from? Yeah. Hang on, we'll just get a microphone over you. We hear a lot of, I'm um, sorry that you feel that way, mm. or I'm yeah. sorry this mm -hmm. happened to but you. There's no accountability, there's no responsibility, there's no... Sorry, we made a mistake. We could have dealt with this better, and I think yeah. that would mean a lot to people. Well, just, just to answer, answer you directly on my behalf, Lorraine, because you know I was working in Downing Street until the 
technically at the end of May and I'm definitely sorry for any acts or omissions on my part that may have resulted in, in more people dying that, than, than should have. Um, what I would say is everybody in Downing Street and when I was working there was doing everything that they thought was, was possible to preserve life and, and livelihoods. And um, yes, there were some things that we got right, you know, shielding, furlough scheme, etc. I'm not going to give you a running commentary on, on all those things because you know what they are. And there are certainly things that, that, that we got wrong. Um, on the report itself, um, I think the report uh, was, was, I mean, I read the whole thing. I, I think it was a good report. Um, Jeremy Hunt and Greg, um, Greg Clark um, highlighted some really interesting things. I think there's very quickly three points that I really, really stood out to me uh, around lessons that could have been learned. I think the first, to, to echo what Robert said around um, finding it convenient to say you were led by the scientists or um, um, or, um, or somehow the scientists were, were, were people that should have been delegated re responsibility for decisions is completely wrong. When you are uh, elected um, you, and you have the privilege to govern, to govern means to choose. And so all of you rightfully should should feel like every single politician or anyone involved in politics and involved in those decisions uh, during those that period and this period should be accountable for the decisions made. And the reality is the scientists, they have biases, they normally have quite narrow areas of, of, of expertise in terms of their specialisms. Um, and, and ultimately, towards the beginning of the pandemic, the scientists and everybody never had access to you know, very good data. So ultimately, the responsibility lies with the, the politicians. I think right. the, sec the, the second thing I'd say very quickly is for me, I think a big lesson from that report was there were some serious challenges around who was in the room. And when I say who was in the room, I mean the diversity of thought. Um, the report highlights things around um, not having enough international experts in the room, which I think was important. I also think it's important that there should have been probably more senior women. We have a, a female Home Secretary, a female a shadow, uh, or not shadow, Equalities Minister. We have a, a female uh, Department for Work and Pensions, Secretary of State. Some, for, to my mind, I felt like they should have been more involved in the decision-making process. And where were the business leaders? Where were the local government uh, leaders who had uh, direct knowledge from the bottom up that could have fed into some of the decision-making processes? And actually, to a large extent, how, how could we have worked more closely with, with the opposition? Because this was a, obviously a national okay. effort required. And, Robert, and, and so okay, just one, briefly, one, briefly, one, one more thing. Uh, one thing I think was missing from the report was any accountability for the media. Now, the media were, of course, very useful when it, when it came to um, making sure important public health messaging was getting out there. But actually, the media was also responsible for peddling a lot of misinformation uh, throughout the pandemic. And Are you some, thinking of anything in particular? Yeah, well, well, I mean, we'll wait for the independent inquiry, so I'm not going to give uh, examples here. But what I would also say is um, some elements of the media are also um, uh, unduly influential on, on how politicians make decisions. And so I think when the independent inquiry happens, these are some of the questions that people are going to need to find answers for. Robert, briefly, you want to come back in? Well, so I want a very to brief point. And one of the things I have to say is that, you know, in spite of requests, the government never made the advice public, though we wanted the, we wanted yes, the scientific advice true. public. And of course, in the House of Lords, there is another select committee, the House of this Science and Technology Select Committee. Okay. We were looking at that virus every day of every week during the, during the pandemic, and we were taking evidence from the scientists. Now, of course, it was, it was confidential evidence, much of it, but actually it's not reflected in that report from the House of Commons. It was a very different view because, of course, what we forget is that the House, the House of Lords, you know, for all its faults, has a lot of expertise, particularly in science and particularly in these areas. And, of course, nobody really paid much attention to mm, what we were saying. Okay. Coronavirus was first mentioned as a word in the House of Lords in January by Lord Patel, who was the chairman of the Science and Technology Select Committee. Alison, so I want to come to you. The question is, against the backdrop of this report, why is it so difficult for politicians to say sorry? Do you think Labour has anything to say sorry for? Well, I, I think about this question a lot. Why is it so difficult to, um, for politicians to say sorry? And the fact that you've asked me that question is actually which, just what I was going to say, which is, I think we get defensive. OK, well, you, you know, don't have to be defensive here. You're among friends, Alison. Would you like to... And I'm just thinking, for example, uh, one of the, the criticisms is that the lockdown was not called for earlier. It, of course, happened on the 23rd of March. Uh, the, the, health sec the Shadow Health Secretary, Jonathan Ashworth, called for the lockdown that morning, and the lockdown was announced that evening. Do you think Labour should have been I th calling for that lockdown? I mean, at the time, obviously, you were in the middle of a leadership campaign. Maybe you are a bit distracted with that and missing in action. No, no, we did. Well, here, no, I am, here, that I am, here I am getting defensive again. And I think that when we say sorry for things, and, you know, as uh, Penny 
has and you know i'm sure that people will when we say sorry for things as politicians i think that what matters is whether you mean it and you can tell if somebody means an apology or not by what they do next by their actions next and i think um professor winston has just given a couple of examples of where we need to listen better we need to listen to a range of experts and where I think that we all could have done better. For me, the thing that came out of this report is actually the issues around social care, which are really profound and really big. They've been going on for a heck of a long time. We've all known we've got severe short staff shortages in social care for a long time, but they also feed into something else that was a problem before COVID which is the way that society functions, where we've got too many people who are working incredibly long hours for too little money. And we know that those people who were on the front line of COVID actually did worse and were more likely to catch it and were more likely um, to, you know, to have more significant consequences for them and their family. We are well and off the question here, which is why is it so difficult for politicians to say sorry? So I'll just ask you, do you think Labour has anything to say sorry for? I think that we tried our best to, to get together a cross-party way of dealing with this issue. Do I, like, personally... Sorry, I what think... am I hearing from the audience here? <laughs> yeah, but... Uh, people are shaking their heads, so hang on. Well, let's let Alison finish and then yeah, I'll come I don't, to you. I, I feel that we have to learn from it and show that we can create a country that is run differently and that's run better. Okay. And that is the best way for us all to be accountable and to learn from the mistakes that have been made. So I'm going to take that as a no, because I didn't hear... What, so, yes, the woman here. I think one of the problems is that we have uh, is we get into the realms of gaslighting. I think we're seeing an awful lot of punitive comments and, and things coming out now. We didn't look at the report from 2016 to, you know, when... Uh, as this Professor is the Winston pandemic preparedness saying, report the preparedness you're talking about. Reports, the report. it's, we're talking about looking at things in hindsight, and I think that's quite right. There was unprecedented, but there were some things that should have been put into place from that report. Uh, and we're in, now in a, a position of being punitive against social care workers, against GPs today. And I think it's unacceptable. And I think the government and Labour, I'm afraid I have to say, need to be accountable. And I think there needed to be much more challenge from Labour to, to the uh, Tories and, and the Conservatives over the past 18 months. And that hasn't happened. And we are gaslighting. <laughs> Yes, the man here in the blue sweater in the centre. I think, um, for me, the issue is perhaps around truth, really, because I'm sort of listening to Samuel and, you know, these discussions that were taking place. At every fork in the road and every press conference, the Downing Street briefings, we heard the fact that we're being guided by the science. So am I sort of understanding this, Samuel, that the right people weren't in the room? Equally, when we talk about specialisms and professors, I thought Chris Whitty was a... a renowned epidemiologist, so correct me if I'm wrong on that. And listening to Sir Robert, uh, Lord Robert there, I'm also thinking that perhaps we didn't get the science right. So I think it's... I'm, I'm just really trying to ascertain what's the truth and what isn't, to be honest. OK, the woman back there in the brown sweater. Yes, you. Me? Yes. Yeah, um, I've been in business for about 35 years, and one of the... Uh, we all make mistakes, and this we didn't see this pandemic coming. Um, and it's about learning from it. And you've just mentioned that. About it's about actually sort of being accountable, as I've been saying, and, and actually learning from it. But one thing I will actually um, applaud the government for is the vaccination rollout. I mean, they, they, it, amazing. <laughs> so to go back to the question, uh, well, the real reason is, you know, Fiona, why politicians don't say sorry is there's a big picture of them in the paper the next day that says sorry over in and on the, on the news, probably with you presenting it. And they, they naturally they have a sort of hope that someone else will be sorry ahead of them. And I think that's... that's an, I'm not just being a bit snarky. I think that's an all-too-human failure. And today, when I heard that the report was coming out, never mind sort of saying sorry, which I can see why that is 
fraught for individual politicians. I did think the thing I think uh, uh, Sajid Javid has to be sorry for is he really was out and about this morning saying he hadn't read the report. Now, to me, I thought that was wrong. Uh, it was, a, as it turned out, when I went through it, a 130-page report. It was perfectly possible to read. It was very clearly laid out. I think there was almost a reluctance to engage with it, and that worries me perhaps a little bit more than whether someone is the one who goes, yeah, it's all on me. I think that is a quite difficult thing to ask politicians to do. This has been a major failure of the British state. I know the report was principally about England, and, but I think it also uh, uh, applies much more broadly across the UK. Uh, the Economist, you know, where I work, has got an excess mortality tracker. And if you just run down it, and I do recommend it, you see that Britain has an excess mortality range of about twice that of Germany, and Germany made mistakes later on in the vaccination rollout, still way ahead of excess deaths of France and Sweden, which had a controversial approach uh, to the pandemic. So whichever route you take, when someone said accountability, and it's always a, it's a really important word, but you know, a lot of countries, in fact, almost every country has something that it's got wrong and needs to be accountable for. But in Britain, it really has been, I should say, specifically in England, as we're talking about that in the report, on a scale that is not acceptable. It has shown not joined up government. I think I do know what went wrong. I think there was a belief in something close to herd immunity, which nobody now wants to... That's not true. Some people still adhere to it. But it, it couldn't have been achieved fast enough without the deaths overtaking it. And that is indeed what happened, and everyone is tiptoeing in government out of the room on that. I would give an honesty award to the person who said, I believed in that then. I had reasonable grounds to do so. There was some scientific support behind it. Some of the advisers were also uh, wrong about that, and I think they should say so. And I give more credit to people who say, I made some mistakes then, and I know better now than those who say, I knew everything all along, because we didn't. There were mistakes made, they were serious. When we come to the public inquiry, we will talk perhaps a bit more about the trade-offs the government had to make about the economy. And I think there were great fears that if they locked down the damage, which uh, we do, you know, we're still dealing with, I'm sure we'll come on to, uh, to the economy. But as it turned out, it was wrong, we should have locked down earlier. It would be better to acknowledge so. Penny? <laughs> so I think, just picking up on a couple of points that have been made, um, the the... The government uh, did some things to help the vaccine programme, but the, the vaccine programme, the credit really needs to go to the scientists who actually were saying um, far in advance, um, we need to be worried about this. And actually, if Oxford University hadn't squeezed down the amount of time that it takes to, to produce a vaccine, we wouldn't have had the vaccine in in time. And what that but what about Anne's and point? Imperial. And, and Imperial, and sorry, yes. And what about Anne's others? point about uh, the, 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 the number of excess deaths in England compared to many other countries? Incredibly so, high, Penny. So, sorry? I mean, they're very, very high. So I think there are things that we, we should have done better. I, I agree with you. Well, not um, allowing and I, so many I, people to die in an excess mortality range is not just some things. It's a very big thing. It is the core criticism. So I understand that, but I would take issue with you saying we let people die. Um, there, there were things that we know now that we should have done and we should have done differently. A lot of the complexity around the decisions are because we were having to pull together different scientific disciplines and work out how we were going to mm. put that information together for non-scientists to make decisions, the politicians. So yes, of course, Anne, there were, there were things that we should have done differently. We have to learn the lessons from that. And we have, in a lot of the things that are in the report, uh, we have already addressed, for example, things like the risk register uh, and, um, and our approach to resilience. Okay. So I completely agree with you. We, we have to learn the lessons and we have to do that swiftly uh, before the main inquiry comes along, as well as during the main inquiry, because we are dealing with all of these things. But you things. don't have to learn the lessons because of the inquiry, surely. No, you have to learn that's... the lessons because we're still in the middle of a pandemic. And also, we have lots of other things to worry about okay. as well. Yeah. You wanted to come back in with yeah, the just, before I, I move on? Just that one of those things that we have to worry about, as I was saying before, is social care. And I think that, you know, I understand the kind of reaction against, you know, as I was saying before, politicians' defensiveness about saying sorry, because this is a visceral thing. You know, for many people, I know social care staff in my constituency who had to go shopping for bin bags, you know, when they should have had proper PPE. And this is a thing about 
you know, that people will be really angry with. And I think we have to find a way of accepting, as Anne said, as accepting those mistakes. And then most importantly, changing and changing our society and changing the way that we um, support people, you know, our older population in particular, to make sure that that would really be learning the lessons, a better life for older people okay. in this country. Let's take another question from Daniel. Daniel Maltby. Oh, but before we do, actually, I'm going to tell you where we're going to be next week. We are going to be in Glasgow, where we will be joined by uh, the action star of the uh, drama Succession. Uh, Brian Cox. And the following week, we're going to be in Stockport with entrepreneur and former Dragon's Den presenter Jenny Campbell. So if you do want to come along and join the debate and be part of our audience, we would love to see you. So that is Glasgow next week and Stockport the week after. And you just go to the Question Time website and you follow the instructions there and you can come along and be part of our audience. And as you can see, it is great to have an audience back. So come and be part of it. Right, Daniel, I'm coming to you now. So Daniel Maltby. Is it acceptable that the Northern Ireland Protocol was fudged in order to get an oven-ready Brexit deal over the line? Anne? Yes, because without that, uh, we were in terrible trouble. I mean, nobody here needs to be reminded. Uh, the politicians on the panel are probably still in deep trauma about uh, what was going on in, in Parliament and what, where that was, was leading us as, as a country as the attempt was made to get the withdrawal bill through Parliament. So the Northern Ireland Protocol was really a sort of bodge on both sides to get away from that. Boris Johnson made clear he wasn't going to accept the backstop. Do you remember the backstop? Those were the days. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, this just goes to show this was a 2016 problem. I think that the Northern Ireland Protocol, I will never say that Brexit it is over. We live with the consequence of it day in, day out, and we will for uh, many years ahead. But, you know, in this sort of Game of Thrones world, this is like one of those big last battles is over the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, I think it, whether or not it was acceptable, and I know people who felt very, very strongly that uh, it was being signed up to by Boris Johnson, as it turned out, simply to, to kind of move on, and that it was not workable. But I think the Europeans knew that too. You know, the European side knew that too. And I'm very... So you think there was a bit of sort of... Gaming or deception depends on how you want to put it on Strong both words. Sides. There, but, well, Chair. no, I just Strong. mean, I just, I sometimes mean well, signing. The, the, so yes, the I mean, I, know, I know, I think I know what you, you mean. No, well, so the reason this question has come about is because you have got uh, DUP MP Ian Paisley Jr. saying Boris Johnson told me personally that after agreeing to the Northern Ireland Protocol, he would that he would sign up to changing that protocol and indeed tearing it up. And also Dominic Cummings, who's special yeah. advisor uh, to Johnson, said Johnson is slightly more colourfully never had a Scooby Doo. What the deal he signed meant, uh, and basically had no, 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 no. no it's so good to have Dominic of, Cummings to tell us. Right? No idea, no, no, no what, what, intention what, what? of sticking to it. No, look, I think there was definitely, yeah, there was, was there dishonesty there? Yes. So I, I don't want to be fly about that. But look, this was not something that could be implemented in this form with trade border down the middle of the Irish Sea. I mean, who are we kidding here? So it was always going to need tweaks, serious tweaks to its implementation which is the, the get out of jail here, is the implementation terms needed to be changed so you didn't have these ridiculous arguments where you've got perfectly good food standards on the mainland trying to send sausages, and I, yeah, whether they're sausages or whether it's the next thing, to Northern Ireland without really major problems when we need to get our trade friction down because that is the most, one of the most important things, keeping our economy flowing. So I am very pleased to say I think we are in the final stages. As one of the few things maybe tonight I'll be very optimistic about. I think the EU side has changed. It is much more flexible uh, under the chief EU negotiator than it was under Michel Barnier. Another remember him. But that was a different tone. Okay. That was a different era. Yeah. I think Boris Johnson, in the end, at his negotiator, Lord Frost, is going to have to give grounds over elements of arbitration. But I think that is going to right. happen. And you can have me back when I'm wrong. So, to you know, the direct question... It's been a long, hard road, but, but there I think is, we are yes, avoiding it is a okay disaster to fudge it. if That's we, what we're saying. If we so, compromise. So, so, Penny Morden, so what you've got people here saying is Boris Johnson told me personally he was going to sign this deal and then tear it up afterwards. Is that your understanding and is that acceptable, as Daniel is asking? So, I wasn't privy to those conversations, but I did have a ringside seat for, for much of the last few years and I think Anne has reminded us of the difficulties uh, that we have faced in terms of, of actually leaving the EU. And was that the, your understanding, that the protocol was being signed without yes. any intention of actually sticking to it? So it was, in my view, negotiated in good faith. The, the issue is that the protocol, was uh, its implementation, was never meant to impact negatively on day-to-day on -day life uh, in, in Northern Ireland. 
Um, and that is not what has happened. Uh, we have seen on 0.5% uh, of EU trade, 20% of the EU's checks. As Anne has said, people that were trading with no friction uh, five minutes before we uh, left uh, are now facing these uh, enormous barriers that don't have to be there. And what you're seeing now is the EU, because of the discussions we've been having and the realisation that if a community in Northern Ireland cannot live with the protocol as it is being implemented, something has to change. What you're seeing now is the EU present proposals in response to ours that they said were impossible five minutes ago. So I would say two things. First of all, I am optimistic. I think this is progress. It, I'm ho hoping uh, for more progress, but, but I think we are now uh, really getting good okay. engagement on this. But I also take issue with people saying that we have not done this in good faith. What I have so told you got, about so for example, how the you've EU got the Irish acted, Deputy PM, that is Leah Varadkar, saying don't make any agreement with the British government till you can be confident that this is a country that can honour its promises. I think we can honour our promises. Um, we, I mean, the fact that we stuck to our guns and left the EU, having had that democratic mandate, shows that these things are important to us. But what we also must do is make sure that they are being implemented in a very practical way. Okay. There is no need for this friction to be there, okay, and we're yes, not going to that. tolerate it being there. Thank you. The man at the back there. Hello. Um, I have great sympathy for the government and the European Union over that time period at the end of 2019. The whole thing was dragged for far longer than it should have been. But what I don't like about Boris Johnson's deal is I think that Northern Ireland was sort of discarded. It was something that was just left to the side. And I think at least with Theresa May and her deal, even though that also had faults, it at least respected the unity of the United Kingdom. Northern Ireland is as part of this country as England, Scotland and Wales is, and I don't think the Northern Ireland Protocol respects that. Yes, you had your hand up there. Yeah, I think Penny speaks about being in good faith. I think it also highlights the naivety of the impracticalities that we've seen now. OK. Alison. Well, a lot of things seem to be happening here that were never planned for. If, if you listen to those who, you know, made the ag agreement uh, in the British government, and it makes me wonder why, because it was, as is described in the, um, in the question, sold to us as kind of oven ready, but this seems to be the least prepared for oven ready deal uh, ever. And there are a lot of things that I think are just not good enough and that we need to build on. Um, but what really worries me most is that the Good Friday Agreement commits the British government to economic development in Northern Ireland, to bringing communities um, together and supporting them. And, you know, I just don't think that we are doing that well at, that, at this time. And quite honestly, you know, I think that people deserve peace and prosperity and not to you know, have to suffer because others are playing politics. So you know, we've got to build on this agreement. We've got to kind of make it work better. There's a whole host of other things that we could talk about um, post-Brexit that similarly we've got to build on and make better so that people can um, have a prosperous right, life right across the United Kingdom. But I do feel, I do feel it makes me slightly cynical um, about some of the promises that were made about this. To be fair, Alison, when Boris Johnson, David Frost, was trying to negotiate a deal, you were too busy trying to uh, go against the will of the people and you were campaigning for a, new re and a, a second referendum. And that's just the truth. The reality <laughs> is the people of this country voted to leave the European it's all Union. Very, it's all, it's all, very, it's all very well to criticise those of us who, you know, who were trying we're to get a deal not, when the Prime Minister was no, trying to get a deal in 2019, I, or were trying to frustrate the will of the people? Which one? I, I but, 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 but Samuel, the so, question is, is it acceptable that the protocol was fudged to get an oven-ready Brexit deal over let, the line? No, but, let the, me, the, let the, me the, answer this point. Let me answer this okay. point. Briefly, about, though, Alison, because then I need to bring in the rest of the About frustrating panel. the will of the people. Actually, you know, what we needed was to bring people together and to find a way forward. And what I tried to do throughout the whole process was to find compromises and to work together. And in the end, it just became impossible. Now, of course, you know, now we're in this situation. To be honest, I think we need to put that behind us 
and we need to look at where we are and say we've got we've got this agreement let's build on it okay. let's try yeah, and make made it that better point. so that Samuel. people can I, I actually agree. get and, on and with their lives i completely agree with Samuel, you. but do you want to answer the actual question which yeah. is is it acceptable that the protocol was fudged again oven ready brexit deal over the line well listen I, i'm not interested in what conversations did or didn't happen what i'm interested in are the facts and the facts were in 2019 we had gridlock in the in the house of commons um, we had a situation where we didn't even know if we were going to have a trade agreement. And so the Northern Ireland Protocol was probably the best solution we could have at the time. Fast forward to now, we have a, a trade deal that was is actually more ambitious than anybody could have ever, ever thought we could achieve. Um, and we have a situation where the people of Northern Ireland have had a chance to live through the Northern Ireland Protocol, and most of them are not happy. And so actually, I welcome the fact that the European Union uh, has been willing to renegotiate the terms. I think some of the concessions that they've offered this week are a step in the right direction. But ultimately, we're in a better place. And what I like, what I would love to see is policies is not talking down the United Kingdom. I think we're going to make a success of Brexit. And for us to do that, we have to come together and stop trying to sound like, you know, the Prime Minister didn't do a good job because he got Brexit done. Talk okay. That's okay. Where you that's where you Criticising Boris Johnson okay. is not talking down our country. Okay. I, I think we've got to, as an, as an opposition, we have a job to do, but, you know, I'm deeply proud of my country and I think we, we will make a great success. What frustrates me is being in this situation where the people of Britain were offered something that just doesn't seem to have come to fruition, where it just okay. doesn't, the consequences of it don't, don't seem to have been planned for. Yeah, Robert. I disagree with that. But... Robert. I, I, you know, I think we have to accept the fact that, you know, the history of our relationship with Ireland goes back a long way where it's been really poisoned and where there have been moments when we could really achieve some amazing rapprochement, certainly when, in fact, after partition and with Northern Ireland. And I do think that, actually, ultimately, if you sign a, a, a document like this, it's a contract, and actually you can't negate that afterwards. So you, it's all very well to say that you, do, you don't actually abide by what you've signed. I think you have to, and I think, unfortunately, one of the issues, of course, clearly, is our, our rejection of the role of the European Court of Justice, because it's not unreasonable that actually the EU would want to see that informed and in place. It probably doesn't actually much matter to the agreement, actually, because I don't suppose there will be a huge amount of legal issue. I mean, there's plenty of people in Northern Ireland who would take issue with that. Yes, yeah. but, it's, but I think the basic principle of, of, of actually negating a treaty that you've made uh, and you've signed is a very dangerous prospect. And I do agree that the risk of trust... You know, we're just seeing the trust just at the time when we're tangling with that massive problem in Afghanistan with people we've left behind, particularly the intelligence people, who are really now being... Uh, uh, recruited to, to the uh, to the to the Taliban, and th that shows that we can't do anything about it. And I think again and again we're going to find ourselves f failing in world politics because we cannot be trusted. I think it's a real risk to Britain, and I think it's something we need to think Can about. Can I very just clearly. make one brief point? Because very the, briefly, a sentence. The trade and cooperation agreement that we signed actually stated we needed to have a risk-based approach. It is because the EU haven't delivered on that that we are in the situation we are with the Northern Ireland Protocol. So it is, I, I agree, people need to honour agreements, but we have acted in good faith. But, but surely not, 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 is, not. Is it acting in good faith if... And, of course, we haven't heard from the Prime Minister. He's in Marbella at the moment, but we haven't heard his response to this. But is... Uh, and, I, and I don't mean that snidely. I mean, everyone's entitled to the <laughs> holiday. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to make a kind of clever point there. But, obviously, we haven't heard from him. Um, is it acting in good faith if, you, if, as at least two people are suggesting, you sign an agreement having no intention of sticking to it? That, that's the point that's being made. So that, I, I don't think that has happened. As someone that has, has watched these negotiations, okay. has been involved in that. Okay. The EU did not uphold what was in the uh, right. trade So that's not what you think happened. And very briefly, and then I'm going to move yeah, on. I, do, I take Robert's point o o on trust in the United Kingdom and what you say, and I do think it is something that uh, the government has to be aware of, that that reputation is out there. You can't quite believe what, what they say. But look, I mean, there is elasticity in 
the interpretation of EU treaties. I mean, we, we, we bore you with the, the past examples, but there is. And I think this was a great example where both sides... What's that great line in Casablanca? You know, she, was, she, she was pretending and I let her pretend. Both sides knew that there was going to have to be change on implementation. If we can get there, and I think we will have to accept some oversight, but I think it will go through a different route, through perhaps arbitration with the ECJ for extreme uh, cases of law, uh, Robert. I think that's a, it would be a very reasonable compromise on the British side. Let's hope we get there. We put the sausage wars behind us and, and move on a bit. Sausage wars. Is that a phrase we'll become familiar with and then in a couple of years time think, God, remember the sausage wars <laughs> while we were talking about that? I, I, hope not. I hope that will become a thing of the past. OK, let's take another question from Grace. Grace Bennett. Following the outrage around a professor at the University of Solicitor's views, how can a campus create a space of free speech while also protecting their diverse student body? So this, uh, what you're referring to, Grace, is there's a controversy surrounding Professor Kathleen Stock, I think it's what you're talking about, who is at uh, Sussex University, and she's been accused of people there uh, of being transphobic, which she has vehemently denied. Mm -hmm. uh, she has faced death threats, she's been advised by the police to install CCTV, cameras outside her home and consider having bodyguards on campus. I mean, since you're asking this question, I just wonder what your view is. I think it's quite dangerous to create a space where people... Because university is meant to be a place where people debate and I hope to go there next year. And so you I, hope to what, be there next year? To be year. at university next year. And I don't want to go to a space where ideas aren't just thrown around. But also, some of the ideas that are being suggested are quite dangerous. And when they're, like, questioning how people identify, how are we... Who are we to express our opinions on them when surely they know what's right for them, rather than what we think. All right, so, um, Alison, does Kathleen Stock have the right to say what she said in, 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 the, in, the, in the name of academic freedom? Um, academic freedom is really important, um, but I think so is respectful debate. And um, uh, the point was made there about questioning um, people's identity and I think that's where our use of language is really important um, I think that you know <laughs> being honest I could be quite critical of politics at times in the way that our use of language um, is not always um, as respectful as it might be but I think the principle here that we should have academic freedom and that people should um, have their identities respected I I really hope we are a country that can have those two principles both together. I don't, so, so I don't see why we can't, whatever kind of identity that we're talking about, I don't see why that we can't have academic freedom and people able to feel you know, respected at university and that they are a welcome student wherever they are. I mean, Kathleen Stock is not here, so let me just say she has said, uh, trans people are trans people, we should get over it. They deserve to be safe, to be visible throughout society without shame or stigma. Um, is, does she have the right to say what she said? Should she be? She's basically said her career is, is over at Sussex University. Should she be able to go back and, and teach freely? Well, you know, it, it's, not from, it's, it's not for me to make employment decisions or whatever. Well, it's not an employment decision, it's the, the, the point the of principle, principle Alison. Yeah, Do you no, think, the, on principle, Kathleen Stock should be able to go back to Sussex University and, and work as a professor? If she's, if she's qualified and she's, you know... Well, she's qualified, those, we know she's those, qualified. Met all of those principles, yes, but the... The point here, the, the point that I'm trying to make is, is it really impossible for people to have, um, you know, well-respected academic careers and also have respectful language that says that people can express their identities in a free way at university and feel welcome? Is that really impossible? Because I really hope that it isn't. And I think, you know, we there's a whole debate on social media that, I mean, sometimes I try to avoid social media and there's this whole debate that I think sometimes raises the temperature. And again, I would be self-critical of politicians in this. Sometimes, you know, we need to look at ourselves as well. But I do not believe that it is impossible for us to adopt a more in common type stance and say that we can listen to people we disagree with and we can do so okay. respectfully and with a bit of understanding and empathy towards each other. So, Robert, I'm interested in your view, given that you were Vice Chancellor of Sheffield Hallam for, for, for some time. I'm sorry. I'm interested in your view, given that you were Vice Chancellor of Sheffield Hallam, weren't you, for, for some time? I mean, this, you've mentioned Kathleen Stock, and, and that's an, a trans 
uh, issue. But obviously, academic freedom has, has been talked about in a number of areas I was, in recent I was, I years. I was rather hoping that you'd be interested in my opinion as a biologist, which is, seems rather more important. Because I've got to say well, I'm just saying it, well, only because the issue well, of academic freedom isn't solely uh, I'm about to say something which will mean trans. that you'll probably want to edit the programme when I finish. But oh, basically... Okay. <laughs> right. OK, I, we're I all say, braced for I was, it. I will say this categorically, that you cannot change your sex. Your sex actually is there in every single cell in the body. You have a chromosomal sex, you have genetic sex, you have hormonal sex, you have all sorts of different kinds of psychological brain sex, they're all different. And we are very confused about this, unfortunately, and, and regrettably it's got into this argument that people are now would, will now accuse me of being transphobic. Well, obviously there are trans people who say you absolutely can do that. Well, unfortunately, you can't say this publicly. This is one of, this is one of the big problems. Even saying, saying this on this programme undoubtedly will result in my getting a huge amount of hate mail. It always does. But I, 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 I do think it's, it, it's a big issue about the attitudes. There are, of course, issues which are important about young people who are confused about their sex, but we won't go down that route here. But it does affect a whole lot of issues in schools and elsewhere in our society. Of course, we should accept people as they are. Overall, I think it's a very sad thing that we can't discuss biological science without actually getting completely caught up emotionally with something which is really completely wrong. Well, as I say, there are, there are, there are people who, who would vehemently disagree with you, so I'm just going to... Yes, I'm going to make, make that clear. I mean, Penny, the question is, how do campuses create a space of free speech while also protecting their diverse student body? That's Grace's question. So I think they, they need to, and we ought to remind ourselves why academic freedom is absolutely fundamental. It's not just because of the values that we have in this country. It's fundamental to our success as a country. Unless you have freedom of thought, plurality of thought, you can't have the creativity, the innovation that you need to move the progress of humanity fundamentally on. So uh, as someone who has been quite vocal on, on trans rights, um, Kathleen Stock should be allowed to say uh, these things. I feel very strongly that we need to protect uh, academic freedom. Um, but I think that we can also do that uh, by... I mean, it's very clear. It's not just that she's having a debate with people. The poor woman is being hounded by people in balaclavas and is, is feeling unsafe. That environment cannot be tolerated. And universities, need, I think, need to take a very strong line. The government has tried to do things to, to strengthen their arm in that through legislation. But, but that is fundamental. And why it's so important, particularly on issues like this, which are hugely complex. You've mentioned some science. There's issues of law uh, involved in this as well. And unless we can have these conversations, uh, and I think that when we, when we do and this issue becomes uh, debated more frequently and, and people are less reluctant to, we'll find actually there's a massive amount of consensus and understanding uh, out there. Um, what we want to do is to enable people to talk about these things, to get informed about these things. And as a society, we need to do that, to grapple with some of these issues which are, are coming to the, the forefront like they haven't been before. Let's hear from the woman in the glasses. I absolutely agree that Kathleen Stock has been treated appallingly. Her union have actually thrown her to the walls, but I was really reassured that her vice chancellor at least supported her. And I have a professional interest in this matter as well, because actually I run services that are actually for, for women, they're single sex spaces, so I'm really delighted to hear Robert's view, and I don't think it's transphobic at all to talk about biology, and actually that cannot be changed. And I think that in universities, they're supposed to be a place where we're able to have critical thinking, critical thought, and it concerns me greatly that that is being eroded. It concerns me greatly that we're not able to have this discussion. And actually, there are plenty of women who are being no-platformed for simply wanting to have this discussion. So I, I think I'm quite appalled how Kathleen has been treated, and I think it is quite appalling that in universities, we are shying away from this critical thought, frankly. What about the, the woman in the blue T-shirt? So, I'm at university, I'm on a course, and I'm really lucky enough to be on a course where we have a large range of LGBTQ plus students um, within our course and in the industry. I'm going to theatre. Um, and I would feel really disgusted if 
a prof a, anyone, a professor or another student, um, made someone else feel unsafe in their course, in their education. Um, I, either way, um, like why should someone's freedom of speech be more protected against someone's freedom to feel safe? I don't agree with, you know, the, her, the treatment of this professor. No one should receive death threats. But, you know, there's science backing it up that, you know, people are necessarily born in the right body. And, you know, there's, there is a lot of science around that. And I just think that we need to maybe have good debates, but that doesn't mean that only one side needs to be heard. We need to hear every side and we need to make sure people feel safe in where they're working or in the course that they're on. And the man behind you. We've been talking for the last 10 minutes, but what did she say? What did she actually say that upset people? Well, uh, or can't it, you it, say that? No, on no, it's not that I can't say it, but it, it relates to comments over a period of time. She's written a book. There have been tweets that she's 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 written. I mean, there's a number of things that people have have, have objected to. I mean, as I say, one thing that she has said is that trans people are trans people and they deserve to be safe, to be visible throughout society and without shame or stigma. But there are other things that she has said that have clearly upset people. For example, she she has she shares. Robert's view about biological sex being something that, that cannot be changed. It can't be changed. Keir Starmer couldn't say the other week the difference between a man and a, fe uh, and a female. No, he wouldn't say that on television. That's not... No. No. Trans women are trans... are women and trans men are men. And, you know, that's, that's a point about recognising people's gender. And the law respects that, as, um, as Penny said before. Um, you know, we're not... I don't think we are actually very good at listening to each other um, okay. on this subject. And I think we also need to hear from trans people directly because actually their experience should inform how we create, you know, a community that does listen to each other properly and does understand where other people are coming from. Samuel. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think I'd agree with the point that people who are trans are not a homogenous group. And so there is an ass assumption that every person who is trans believes that, you know, certain has a particular worldview. I think freedom of speech is really important. Um, one of the biggest challenges as a country is people operate in silos. So if you're on social media, you follow everyone that thinks like you more often than not. Um, your friendship circles are usually people with similar backgrounds, similar classes, similar types of education, similar work. And so the big challenge we have here is everybody is screaming, let's protect freedom of speech and let's be safe. But nobody is willing to cross the aisle and, and have dialogue with someone who may, they may not agree with. I also think that the, the Prime Minister was right to say that, you know, when you're having this debate, respect is key. Um, people who, who are, tra um, uh, are trans are also very vulnerable. More often than not, um, uh, one of the things I was working on at number 10 just before I left was the mental health white paper, which I think we managed to get published early on in the year. Um, and some of the data that I was presented with was very alarming, I must say. Um, and so we just have to be very respectful, but we also have to appreciate that we don't have to agree with everybody for, for people to feel safe. You, you should not just feel safe because you're around people that you agree with. You should feel safe because you should be allowed to disagree with people and still feel safe. But, and that's where we need to get to as a country. But, but, I mean, with Anne, let, let me try this with Anne. It, it is very hard because there, there are competing rights here. And I think sometimes there's a desire to go around and say, can't we all just discuss this nicely together is probably, no, we can't. I mean, we should certainly be polite and respectful, Alison, but that doesn't get around the fact that they're fairly hard disagreements, which I think, to an extent, you're trying to fudge, and I think your party is trying to fudge. And it, it goes a bit like this. Robert has given a pretty strong, quite fundamental view of, of biological sex. A challenge to that is the rise of different feelings about gender, uh, people being born into the wrong body, as someone said quite, quite, you know, quite rightly. And, and that is a, something to be taken seriously. Clearly, <laughs> trans people have rights. They must have some rights. I mean, we're, you know, we're in a, a society in which, which we do believe as we should be open to people living the lives that they want to lead. But there are obvious clashes here. What is an all-female space, then? Who can be in it? Who can't be in it? Who can be in it on certain terms, etc.? These are arguments we are going to have. I've become a lot more curious about the difference myself between gender and sex. I, pro I yeah, fundamentally, it's all to start with perhaps from Robert's position, but I do think we have questions to answer and that protection of minorities is something 
good liberals, whether they're left liberals, right liberals, small L liberals like me, should be interested in. Where I think the free speech point comes in, and the, the lady had a really good uh, point in provocation, just uh, seeing you there in the middle. I'm, I'm sorry, you're probably not going really to like what I say. Uh, you should feel physically safe, you should feel supported in terms of your university. But in terms of your views, no, I can't guarantee you that you will feel safe. You will feel challenged, you will feel uncomfortable. It's what happened to me when I went to university. It's what happens here at this university in Nottingham and beyond. And therefore, freedom of speech does have to underpin this argument. It's what enables us to have a better argument. But we won't always feel that our particular view is being as protected as we might like. But that is the robustness of what it means to have free speech. I... Yeah, I... I... I don't, I don't think the law fudges it. I think the law protects people on the basis of their gender identity and it also makes um, sex-based exemptions where it's a legitimate uh, and means... And they're coming under challenge, Alice, and that's the point. Yes, but that is the, the weighing of rights and that's a normal process um, that, you know, you know, that we go through. There's many conflicts in, in the law like that and, and, and rights are weighed. But I just want to kind of go back to the point that you made about of course, you will feel unsafe. I mean, firstly, to Samuel's point, like the Prime Minister is a person who has used terms about people's identities in print that I think really ought not to have been used. And I, I think that's what I mean by leadership from the top on this. We all have to weigh our words. But he's also apologised. And when, let me finish. And, no, but you, you and brought when, it up, so when, he's not here to defend himself, so he sentence. also apologised. So. So when we say we all have to weigh our words, that is what I mean, because yes, of course, your opinions should be challenged. But this country is one in which there is a history of people being treated differently on the basis of their identity, whether that is their gender, whether they're from a working class background or not. And so we have to recognise that as a truth about our country, that people are treated differently and somehow that has got to change and it's got to be equal respect not just saying, well, you know, everybody, you know, has to put up with the rough and tumble of argument. OK, but let me argue on the basis of my ideas. Don't look down upon me on the basis of my identity, which has gone on in this country for far too long. The man there in the blue sweater. I think, and this is somebody who works in universities, I think the crux of the issue here is, and I take Samuel's point, for example, about social media and sort of polarised views, but I think the, the crux of this, this issue really is anybody who works in education or higher education settings, the key part of the role is to, to appreciate students' diversities and create inclusive environments and, and make people safe. So I think that's the issue. But com the conflict within that is that universities are a place where ideas and different yeah. thoughts are appreciated as well. So I think that's the real conflict here is, is the, the person's role who, who is really employed to, to make their students feel safe. That's yeah. the key I to agree. it. Can all. I just quickly say, yeah. Yeah. peace is not the absence of conflict, right? And so we need to get to a place where we have enough trust and relationship in each other to have tough conversations that we might not like, but we, we also have to be able to believe that we all want the same thing, which is a, a country that is open, tolerant, free for everybody to live whichever lives they, they choose to. So the challenge we have is we don't have enough people who are different engaging with each other in a constructive way. And that's exactly why More In Common, Joe Cox Foundation do some fantastic work that's focused on doing exactly that, but we need more of it. OK. Uh, I'm afraid our time is up. I'd love to bring you back in, sir, but our time is up. Thank you very much to the panel for coming along this evening. Thank you, of course, to you here in Nottingham. Very good to see you all. And, of course, thank you to you at home for watching. And if you want to hear more about what's going on, current affairs, you can ca catch a newscast with Laura Kingsburg, which is following on after this programme. But from Question Time in Nottingham. <laughs>